All right, everybody, on to our next topic here. Um, we are really privileged to have Rupert McNeil here. Rupert, you, I don't know whether you know, but you're the only um, doubleheader. You've been on both days. What, really? You're the only one who appeared twice. That's very, so, very patient of everybody. Yeah. It also means you really got to deliver right now. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, he appeared twice. That's right. I don't count. <laughs> I'm staff. <laughs> so, um, so Rupert, uh, Rupert McNeil is the chairman of Storm Energia and also the chairman of Optimal Organizational Outcomes, 3XO. He's the formerly the UK's chief people officer. And before that, he was the group HR director at Lloyd's. And then uh, before that, he was senior HR roles at Aviva and Barclays. So there's lots of HR experience. Now you're not doing HR, you're a chairman. Uh, but also, it's a lot of HR in it. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, also, uh, a whole variety of industries. And so, um, you know, as you've done this, what, what are some common challenges you've seen across organizations in running the HR thing? What are some common challenges? What's one of your favorite answers for how you overcame them? I think it's, so, every organizational context is very different, but I've got a very clear view about how organizations run. <laughs> so you have a, an organizational purpose, I can't remember if I said this yesterday, an organizational purpose, which in government might be serving citizens or defending the realm, it might be in banking, you know, generating profits to shareholders from your operations. So you've got your strategy or your purpose, your strategy fulfills your purpose, and then there's an operating model to deliver the strategy. And there are many inputs into that, but broadly the key ones that make up most of the work are you need money, you need technology, you need data, and people. And then around all that, you've got the wrapper of culture. And although you've got those four layers and that cultural wrapper, that is distinctive in every organization. So one of the most fascinating things for me uh, when I was sort of getting ready to go into Lloyd's was I went into a Halifax branch and a Lloyd's branch. So this is actually using the same systems, the same technology systems. But when you go into them, the customer experience is completely different. And then, you know, the way the manager talks to you. I remember actually I went into, I mean, I'm a Lloyd's customer. I have been for like 40 years. I go into Lloyd's and, you know, could I please see your ID? Are you who you say you are? <laughs> the HBOS one was a bit more open and welcoming. Maybe they, they, they checked. But it was, it was interesting. And neither was wrong. It was just fit, it was fit for purpose for, the, for who the customer was. And... It, what was then fascinating for me when I got to see data when I was in Lloyd's was that actually the demographic breakdown of those two populations is not that different. <laughs> Interestingly, that, maybe, maybe that's changed, but then that was all struck, really? Mm -hmm. that, you know, and and you'd, you'd have call centers who'd have different scripts for those different, different groups. And it was quite hard, I think, for people, I'm sure people are aware of this, who, who had to deal with call centers with multiple brands, but when you, when you dial into the call center, you know, you, you, people are in a mode, if they're switching from Lloyd's to HBOS, they need a break so they can get into their new mode. Hmm. <laughs> so maybe that's all changed and it's all AI now, but, but that's a, a, it was really, really interesting. So, but, but, that, but that aside, you've got this, so that's a difference in culture, it's a difference in the operating model, um, how, you, how you sort of use, use those components. And when you come to central government, which was a huge privilege to be involved in, central government is a sector made up of about 100 of those different operating models. It's the biggest diversified corporation. Yeah, yeah. Very, very diverse corporation. And I was fortunate to come into it at a time when it was becoming much more integrated because functions were being, were being introduced into it. So, um, and, and I think for me, the, the, the big, the most interesting thing for the past sort of 10 years of my career has been being there during first EU exit and then COVID and seeing how operating models can evolve very quickly. And I was actually, I was, I was at a select committee yesterday and gave this example. This is a, a long delayed exit interview in the House of Commons. And they, um, so back to my point about operations and, and modes of operations, there were, um, when, when lockdown happened, people had to go home and work from home and actually it was remarkably successful. But HMRC had invested about four or five years ago in tablets for everybody. DWP had not. And DWP is a much more retail operation anyway. And so it was much easier for HMRC to switch its operations quickly to a remote basis than it was for DWP. And then you layer into the fact that 
many of the people working in DWP's job centres are people who themselves are carers and then will be in a sheltered situation when they're at home. So that, those are all operational issues at the operational layer about people. And back to this point about people, technology, data and money, of all those organisational inputs, the interesting thing about people, of course, is that they are, you know, they have ideas and will and agency of their own. So they're a different type of input <laughs> to the corporate system. Yes. And actually, that's what HR is all about, is optimising that. Okay, cool. So I want, I want to come back on, the, on some of these mm. things you did in the government because it's just so fascinating. But I, I need to ask, ask you a half serious question. Mm. As an HR chief, why are you running around looking at customer experiences and branches? What, 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 why are you doing that as an HR leader? Because everything has to be about the experience of where you're making your revenue, mm -hmm. and you have to go back upstream from that. And I learned, I went to, um, it, it was interesting, the place where I learned most about, or first had my sort of epiphany, I, I sort of view my career as moments of realized incompetence. And uh, the realized incompetence uh, when I left Barclays and went to Aviva was they had just gone through this amazing revolution of systems thinking. And they had, they had particularly in the sort of the customer service side, and they'd worked out that actually you need to ask the people who are serving the customer what the problems are. Mm -hmm. And the classic example for me from that was in life assurance, where one of, the, one of the key tasks, obviously, is you have to pay people when their spouse has died and they're going to get the widow or widower's benefit. And that was a process that took far too long, and that's actually a time when people need cash in their lives and it has to be sped up. So you actually go to the people who are doing that work and say, how can you speed this up? And they got it down from weeks to about 48 hours. Wow. And they did that because they knew if you spoke to the registrar of the death, you could actually go through all your compliance things reasonably easily. Now then they had to convince the compliance people that mm -hmm. that was acceptable, so that was another, another piece, but they were getting support to do that. So, and there's a great, there's a great moment, you know, because HR has lots of processes like that, because HR is fundamentally a B2C activity in many ways. You'd look at a sheet and say, well, hang on a minute, I realize now that all these, all these controls and problems that are slowing down the experience have been generated by me and other well-intentioned senior leaders interfering in the system. Let's just strip it right back and work out what's the easiest way to serve the, serve the colleague. So it's interesting what you're saying is you're saying Human resources is not about supplying the resources. It's about helping people do the right thing. Uh, absolutely. It's about two, it's about, human resources is about two things, in my view. It's about optimizing processes involving people. So how do you make sure that you're not making false positive hires? How do you make sure that, you're make the, that the capability and capacity, I mean, every organization, if you think about it in terms of what is people risk, there are three risks. That you don't have enough people. You don't have people with the right skills, and that's capacity capability and conduct. Those are the three things that you're trying to manage. Mm -hmm. And you are an enabler for line management to do that and making sure they've got the systems to do that. So that's the first thing, people processes. The other actually is optimizing interpersonal relationships in the workplace. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's what makes it such a fascinating domain. You've got those two aspects. Fantastic, great. So let's talk then about the government, right? And, and the government uh, here, you know, it is a big, diverse set of mm. responsibilities. Uh, as you said, it's becoming more and more integrated. But also, you know, we got a lot of people here in the for-profit sector, mm. and um, it's different. So having come from for-profit into government, what were some of the differences you saw, and what are some commonalities you saw in how to drive the change there? So it's not, it, it's not, it's not so different, mm -hmm. uh, but it has some very key differences. So it's anybody who's, the people who don't do well moving into I think a public sector role are people who are from, have perhaps ex got experience in smaller organizations and believe that you do things by direction. Mm. But any of us who've worked in large complex organizations anywhere know that's not the way the world works. So, you, you, so if you're used to complex organizations, you will be, you'll find it very familiar when you go into, I think, into, uh, into government. There are some real differences, but they're quite surprising. So first of all, it moves either very slowly or very, very quickly. That's the one someone Can you tell the difference too. beforehand? Well, you, you, you need to know it could go that way. Okay. <laughs> but it is, it's really quite a different, uh, so that's, that's quite different. And, and particularly if you're in, and that is actually your opportunity and power, is when you see there's an opportunity to make a quick, swift change, you can go through the gap very quickly. So um, 
but the rest of the time, you know, it's just pretty, you can be a bit, a bit of a slow burn. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that it is, and this is where I think it's really relevant and good to get experience in government, because it is hyper-transparent. Mm. The future of the world in business, which is becoming increasingly transparent, is there in government and has been for years. So there isn't a single action, and this does affect the way people behave, that is not scrutinized. And I'll say now, in my, now I'm a, a consumer of government services, particularly ones involving the environment, you know, I'm already thinking, actually, I might want to get that process going by putting in a f uh, freedom of information request, because I'm really puzzled by why that happened. Mm. And so, you, so I can see, you know, it's interesting looking at it from the other side. So I think you've got, a, um, you've got the transparency point, and there is very little money. Or rather, there's very little, that's not quite true. There's very little opportunity to get more money when mm. you get it. And you've got to spend what you get. So you can't buy your way out of trouble. So if I think about one organization I was in where overnight a large financial model evaporated in the cloud, <laughs> and then it was rebuilt. If that happened in government, A, everyone would know about it, and you probably wouldn't have the money to fix it and do it again. So people are quite, uh, perhaps a little bit more cautious of that. And then everything in government is ultimately linked to, in a democracy, the citizens voting in the government and giving it control over their lives to some extent, and that's a big responsibility. So um, there is a you know, really good set of guidelines called the Nolan Principles, which everybody who's involved in UK public life needs to follow. I'm sure they always do, but they should follow it. Um, you know, whether you're a school governor or a magistrate or, work or a civil servant. And that's, uh, you know, that sets a really powerful cultural standard. So actually, I think, I, I now think differently about defining culture in terms of principles than I did before, because I've seen it work more effectively in that environment. So I've, you know, if, and go into, go into public service with a lot of humility and go in, not for the money or for any kudos, but go in because you will learn a huge amount. And the other thing is, they have a very good learning culture. I qualify as an accountant when I was there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I'd been in my private sector jobs. Interesting. So let, let's jump in. You, you, you were getting there. So let, let, let's, let's just push this mm. a little bit farther. Uh, human resources as culture change. Mm. And you've been, you've been hinting at it. So you know, certainly you hear about this idea that HR should. Very few companies take that role. But how do you use HR as culture change, or how have you used it? I think, you'd, I think you've got to have a, I think it's, I mean, HR, like finance, like technology, is a facilitating function of experts. And any expert in any area, and I guess that counts everybody in this room, is always, we talked about yesterday about the Dunning-Kruger effect, that's what you're fighting. <laughs> the, you know, experts are there to help people appreciate the counterintuitive and not do stupid things. Mm -hmm. So um, the... Well, actually, take a, let me take a, 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 an example from the, that will be familiar to most people. So I sat in a meeting with permanent secretaries at the start of the pandemic where Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty, who are phenomenally impressive individuals as the chief scientific advisor then and the chief medical officer, and they talked about what was coming down the pipe. And they said two things that really, just, they said many things. This is what stuck in my mind. One was, there is an iron law of epidemics. It exponentiates. So that's why you need to, if you remember, squash the hat. So you've got to be, you know, the R number is what you're controlling for. And the second thing they said was that the work on public health and more generally on, on, on how people respond to regulation is people will accept a lot of um, restriction as long as they know it's fair. I mean, fairness came up yesterday briefly, but as long as they know it's fair, as long as it's applying to everybody, it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter you know, where, where you live in the country, as long as, as, long as it's fair. Right, right, well, okay. So, so if you knew that, and, and as an HR person, you knew that. So imagine you're sort of looking at the whole system, you're saying, okay, that's what we've got to keep. We've got to keep to that principle. And you could imagine similar principles in financial services or some of the things we talked about yesterday in values. Uh, Michael, so yeah, those, those things that Now, if... If someone drives from one part of the country to another during lockdown when they shouldn't, and then appears in the garden and justifies that, that's immediately hit that point, right? If someone, if some people have a party, and that's known, that immediately hits that point. And so I think it was, it was just so, I, thought, I can't believe it, how's that happened? It's so obvious. So, um, 
And what is that about? That's about knowing that your fundamental principle is fairness and you've got to, you've got to drive that. Now, it isn't the job of the HR function to do, to do more than facilitate that in the same way it's not more the, the role of the finance function to make sure that the money's being spent properly. Mm -hmm. But we, we should be, as a function, the experts in helping make sure people are asking the right question <laughs> and are aware of it and reminding people. Because you could have put that into, in my three risks, capacity, capability, conduct. Mm -hmm. That's about conduct. Right. And that's about, you know, one of the things which is most critical in any organization, because fairness is absolute. People will, it's a general, there's a great Harvard Business Review article actually about fairness, mm -hmm. process fairness. In a way, that's the, everything that HR is about, is, process, is getting process fairness. If you break that, you will just have horrendous problems. And that's why people resent, if you think about disproportionate parts of the enterprise getting disproportionate shares of the bonus pool, or disproportionate performance ratings, or people, be, people in more senior positions being treated differently for disciplinary reasons. Those are all really bad things, and they undermine the social contract that sits under any organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we think about the, MIT's done a lot of studies that, since before mm -hmm. I was born on what culture's about, mm -hmm. one of the ways to think about it is there, there are the stated values, mm -hmm. there's the hidden assumptions in our mm -hmm. head, and then there's the practices that we, that Absolutely. instantiate those. And so I want to push you a little bit. You said HR can't change the culture, but HR can make sure you're asking the right questions. Can HR push the values? Can HR change the practices and make, uh, make a bigger uh, change than that? Completely. I think, if you're, I think if you are, and that's why I, you know, I'm a great fan of professions of all kinds, because professions have codes of practice. The CIPD code of practice is pretty good. Mm -hmm. SEMA code of practice, the CMI code of practice. If you're following those and you feel that those things are being well, it's actually, it's, it's actually a question I ask in interviews of, of HR directors, which is, could you tell me a time when you felt that your integrity came under pressure? And actually, I don't ask quite that question, because I say, I assume that we, we all have ethical integrity. Right. So I ask, your technical integrity comes under pressure. Hmm. And to an HR person, where you're being asked to do things which are culturally unsound or bad practice, then that might, that might happen. So I think, you, I think that's... You can, you can change, and you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't want to be in an organization in any functional role which isn't listening to your advice. So why don't more HR groups do this? Stand up and take the more change role, the more helping the organization move forward as opposed to just supplying <coughs> services? Because every, every single interaction in the B2C world of HR, <laughs> which is what it is, is a cultural act. Mm. So every hiring, every interview, every pay decision, and so it has to. It's not. It's an and. It's, it, it imbues everything. It imbues everything that you do, particularly in hiring. I would say that's probably where it's most where it's most acute. Mm -hmm. And because people get invested in the decisions they're making in the hiring process, and perhaps don't feel free enough to say either on either side, actually, candidates and hirers, that that's it. Um, this isn't going to work for us. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, I, I'm just thinking, you know, how many companies I've been in that say the last thing you want to do is talk to HR because then bad things happen. <laughs> and so you're, you're just displaying a whole different approach to this, that, you know, trying to get the right behaviors. Okay, so let's jump forward. A lot of experience in HR. You're now helping to run companies and helping leaders to run their own companies. Um, what's the future? How does this, how does, what's the future of HR and talent looking forward? So, so I'm a big uh, fan of Elliot Jacks mm -hmm. and the model of the requisite organization. So you have, so the basic concept, which I think is almost universally true, is that no organization in the world needs more than nine layers because those are the levels of work. Mm -hmm. So if you're the president of the United States or a large corporation, you're at the top layer. Your, your planning horizon is decades, centuries perhaps. And as you go down, you go down to the lowest layer, which is you know, the shop floor, as it used to be called, where the interaction is, the, the, the planning horizon is, is transaction by transaction. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are different levels of complexity from sequential work on a production line up to you know, multi-dimensional complexity at the top. And people generally over time move up the curve and do more and more complex jobs. That's, that's what happens in adult development. Mm -hmm. 
So well, what's happening now is that you've got nine layers. You had nine layers. That's for a global organization. A domestic organization only needs five or six. The bottom two layers are being done by bots. So what's actually happening, I mean, there's a you know, corny phrase, you know, you're taking the, the robot out of the human in employment and roles, and that is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So you're, mo you're, you're seeing the type of skill that's being deployed increasing. I mean, you can see that, take an example, I mentioned job centers. So job centers or prison officers, two examples I gave yesterday. So in a job center, there was a lot of admin, a lot of form filling and entering things into keyboards, but actually with the in all the infrastructure that came around with universal credit, and you can see similar things in banking with their systems, a lot of that admin went out, which meant that people could become work coaches to spend more time interacting with the customer to help them find their next job. Mm -hmm. Prison officers spend less time, you know, getting people phone cards and doing meals because they could actually spend time rehabilitating because there's automation going on in the, in the prison, mm -hmm. in a modern prison anyway. That's all about the buildings, the architecture, that's a whole separate subject. But so, so I think you've got, um, those are nice examples of at every level how it should be more empowering to have that, have that technology. And are we creating, I guess my concern is, particularly when you look at the power of some of these tools that we talked a bit about yesterday, like you know, chat GPT and other things, and so that, you know, I've written my first, you know, it's cut hours off writing technical documents using those mm -hmm. tools. But they require a lot of care to use to make sure they're not hallucinating and that you're using them properly. So there's a whole new body of how to use those tools, mm -hmm. which is no really, you know, is that really that different from learning to use Excel? Not really, but it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also a question, this does come back a bit to the values point we were talking about earlier, about with those tools, how do you take discerning, how do you make discerning judgments about your work? Because that's the characteristic as you move up the hierarchy of work levels. Mm -hmm. But actually, values become a more important part of that, of that decision making. And that's where um, it's, I think we need to make sure that everybody, whether they're on apprenticeship schemes or coming as graduates or existing employees, are being given the opportunity to explore and learn about that. And I have a natural bias to, bias to saying there isn't enough science and STEM, but actually, there's a lot that comes from the humanities, which is a good way to learn that. Let me throw out a couple of words. Choose one or two of them, the words when we think about the future of HR. You know, uh, certainly more monitoring, more analytics, flatter organizations, uh, more digital mm -hmm. skills, more human skills. Any of these things light you up and say yeah, that's important for the future? I think, I think they all are. Okay. I think, I, I, think I, I get a bit concerned about the analysis. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I think it's, it, this is interesting that when you look at the, and I've seen this in practice in very senior leaders, so there's a particular, back to that levels of work, there's, and you can Google this and find this and, and see these levels, but level four is the, so level three is you know, management, maybe a three year time horizon for the job. Jobs, not people, it's about jobs, not people. Level four is about understanding the system you're in and managing the uncertainty and controlling it. It's the, it's the world of the Gantt chart. Level five is about accepting uncertainty and or exploiting it. And you have a really interesting thing where people move. So I'll give you a true example. Sadly, the person that is applied to has passed away. He was a very nice man, but he was an example of somebody who moved from a level four mindset to do a level six job, and it was painful. Mm. So in that organization, no names, no pack drill, he believed that he wanted to know the performance of every branch worldwide in real time as a, as a divisional CEO. And this, this is a true story. The only way that a screen that big could be found for his office was from the screens that are used for nuclear power stations. It comes from Korea. Now that screen was delivered about two weeks after he left his job. <laughs> so it went into a reception to be used as a screen. But, it, but, but the idea that you could control a system like that by looking at a screen of data right. is really terrifying. I mean, that's, what you, that's why you delegate. That's why you have a system. That's why you trust people. That's why you have culture. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't know what's going on in that 
branch in that remote part of Africa, right? So, um, so I think it's the you know being uh, being realistic about what the analytics can give you, and, and I think we've all been in those meetings with particularly with certain types of non-executive directors where they say, mm, "Could we have some more data on this?" You say, "Well." Isn't that, could, just, that this is a stalling tactic? Though? Stall, well, it's a stall, I, I think it's a stalling tactic. It's also lack of confidence and, and other things. Say, well, no, you don't need that more data. You now you're being paid to take a decision. Use your judgment. This is all the data you're going to get. Right. Decision making under uncertainty is a you know business school staple. But that's there's, there's going to be more. Of, there's going to be more of that. Mm -hmm. And so actually, when you think about it, when you sort of put the question to your bot, your your AI, and say, could you, um, you know, what are my choices here? The human has to make the choice. Okay, so um, we've got about two minutes left. If you were to say, based on your experience uh, at multiple levels, multiple different kinds of sectors, and this is a group that cares about learning and development and talent and making HR work well and helping the technology mm. go in there, what's a word or two of advice for how to make those changes happen in their organizations? So, I, so I've, I, I was thinking about this problem and I was thinking about three moments in my adult life that stand out. So one is the first time when I was about 23, someone mentioned the internet to me in the early 90s. And I didn't understand what, it, what, it, what they were talking about. And I had the same experience when I saw, I, I, I joined Arthur Anderson at 28, and most people around me were about 23, yeah? I yeah? 27, yeah. 27. And so, but they all had mobile phones. So what, what is this? I've never seen, you know, this is like 1995, so I went out and got myself one. But those are two bits of technology, you know, that they weren't in my world, and I brought them into my world. And then I remember talking to a great friend and colleague at Aviva. He said, oh, "I've got this. I've got streaming. What's streaming? I don't know what streaming is. You know, but now you know I don't watch any form of television other than television to stream. So, but the point is, they meant nothing to me until I'd actually experienced them. So, you know, getting out there and experimenting with. I, I highly recommend, by the way, there's an app called Poe. Oh, come across this. Like you, Edgar Allen? P.O.E., or? yeah. Same okay. call off that. And there are, you can subscribe at a reasonable price to about six different AIs. Hmm. It's, re it's really neat. So, you know, experimenting with that, trying that, getting people to, you know, just, just feel what that technology could actually do and see how it might, you know, change the way in which they, um, they do their roles and encouraging people to think about how, how they would like to change their role rather than imposing it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming in thank twice you. and for sharing your, your expertise and your thank insights you with everybody. Thank you. Thank you.